All right, so uh, Cole is going to tell us about uh, property history and property variables. All right, so thanks. Uh, all right, I'm Cole Vick. Uh, this is my work with over the last year with my advisor at UT Austin, Kim McMillan. And so, yeah, so what I'm going to talk about is synthesizing history and property variables for symbolic model checking. So if you don't know exactly what that means, hopefully it'll be clear at the end. Uh, but just a little preface to the talk, I, I don't want to get in too much detail about, you know, the actual implementation and all this stuff. I just want to give us the, sort of the general flavor of our technique in general. So, but first, a little motivation. So quantified invariants are important. They're useful for expressing properties about arrays and maps where you need to know something about a large, you know, swath of a particular variable. But they're difficult to generate with, even with modern day solvers that are really fast. These, uh, they're, diffi they're, they're difficult to generalize from cases. They're, you know, basically trying to learn a general rule from a specific amount of cases. So can we generate unquantified invariants? So I claim yes. Oh, wait one second. Right, and so I'm gonna motivate this with a little example. And so you can see, we just have in the right program here, we have this little for loop that just says um, A of zero gets zero, A of one gets one, A of two gets two all the way up to N. And we have the second loop that basically picks a random index of A and assigns it into some index of B. So B of zero could be A of one, and et cetera, et cetera, up to N. And then we want to check this universal property such that um, if J is in the range zero to N, we have, if we read B at J, then it will be positive. So of course this should be true. We only assign positive values into A, and we only assign values of A into B. But if we want to prove something about this property, we're going to have to know a quantified invariant over the second loop, something like uh, all indexes of A, or all reads of the and, uh, array A will be positive. So we can transform this to use proxy and history variables. So we'll, hopefully this will be a little more clear by the time I'm done. But right now we can see we've replaced this particular uh, quanti or universal quantifier with a read at, at one particular index, so this PV1, we've prophesied the exact index we need to know something about here. And then we've also stored a piece of state as a history variable. So now I hope you can see that to prove this, um, or to, use the, to find an invariant for this loop, you may only need to use uh, a prophecy variable. You're not, you're not gonna need to use a quantifier. You could just say, oh, the, um, the value of A at PV, uh, sorry, the, uh, the value of A of X is positive, and then you can sort of backtrack, or you can sort of propagate this to the property and, and then know something about PV1. So now you can say, oh, I know PV1, or B of PV1 should be positive, therefore I can prove something about, um, or I can prove this property as a whole. And so this transformation uh, is typically done by hand. So it's just this transformation from one program to another using this sort of um, just applying these uh, history and proxy variables by hand. So if you get nothing else away from the talk, I want you to get away that we can take a program that used to need a universal quantifier or some sort of quantifier to prove uh, the invariant and transform it just by hand to use proxy variables so now we don't need to use quantifiers in the invariant. But the rest of the talk is going to be, be about how we do this process automatically. And so our approach is that we want to find quantifier free invariants, of course, and we're going to replace quantifiers with auxiliary variables, like in the previous example, and we're going to find auxiliary variables using counterexample guided abstraction refinement. And so the high level overview is that we start with an array program here, so this is our first example, and just a disclaimer for the rest of the talk, oh sorry, for the rest of the talk, uh, we're just going to be considering the array theory for this work. We've only considered the array theory. So we take an array program, we translate that to an abstract transition system, so we have just, you know, an initial state, set of state variables, transition relation, uh, property. And then we pass that to a quantifier free invariant generator. This might give us an abstract counterexample, and it might give us by abstract, I mean a counterexample that does not abide by the array theory. And so we pass the abstract counterexample to the refinement generator, and so this is what we're going to talk about really for the, re and this is like where, you know, the main contribution of the work comes in. And then from this, we'll get a refined transition system. So we'll add some piece of the array theory back in, and then we'll just continue in this loop until we hopefully get approved. So now, how does the refinement generator work? So it, it works by refuting this particular abstract counter example. So we want to show that this value that, that we've gotten in the abstract counter example is impossible if we were to apply the array theory correctly. 
So how do we refute it? We refute it by finding relevant refinements. So relevant refinement is one that uses the array theory. It's one that's related to the property. So hopefully, you know, this particular refinement will allow us to get, to get toward a proof. And then it's hopefully as simple as possible. So we don't want to add a bunch of auxiliary variables, a bunch of axiom instantiations that don't matter and that won't generalize to a proof. So now uh, the definition of a refinement. So refinement's a triple. It will always have an axiom instantiation of the array theory, which will either be uh, an instantiation of the constant array axiom, which basically says there's this function constant array. If you read, so it'll pass back a, an array such that if you read at any point in the array, um, oh, sorry, so if you say constant array of zero, it'll return to you an array such that every location uh, of the, or every index of the array uh, zero. It'll be, oh, sorry, so yeah, just as a, it's just going back. These are the three sort of uh, array axioms. This is what I mean by the array theory. So then we have the application axiom, which would say that if you write at a particular index and then you read at that index, you'll get the value you wrote. And then the preservation axiom, which says, if I write at a particular value, all the other values stay the same in that array. And so refinement will always have an axiom instantiation, and it may have a term to prophecy, and it also may have a... Um, a history condition. So a term. So remember in that original example, we had this. We, we stored a history variable at a particular location when a when a certain condition was true. So th th this is what that history condition is. And then again, right. So these are just th these aren't super necessary to memorize, but these are the these are the uh, formulas for these um, array theories, for, for the array theory, and we'll see these a little later when we talk about um, how we actually find and instantiate um, axiom instances. So now I want to talk a little bit about auxiliary variables. So just to give a sense of, of these things that you may or may not know about. So prophecy variable is basically a future value about, oh, sorry, uh, that we need to know. So it's basically a guess about the future value in the initial state. So the way a, proper, a prophecy variable is going to work is that it can take any value in the initial state, and then it maintains that value throughout the rest of the program execution. And then a history variable stores values that we want to remember. And history variables help prophecy variables to guess correctly. So we can condition the property on the prophecy on the prophecy variable and history variables being equal. And then they basically operate as the prophecy variable is the guesser and the history variable is the checker that makes sure the guess is correct. So now we're back to this array scattering example. So we've done this. And then we can do this static transformation. This is, comes out of a process called Herbandization, which is some, you know, logical process that allows you to get rid of universal quantifiers. But now we've successfully prophesied the location where we want to read B. So now, now, now we've eliminated the, the universal quantifier and we say, we know we need to know something about the array B at PV1. And now just to sort of get our bearings, we've, we're right here. So we've passed, we've passed that previous program to a quantified invariant generator. And now we're going to analyze the abstract counter example as if we were the, as if we were the refinement generator. So now, so remember I said that the refinement should be related to the property. So this is what I mean. We start our, um, our refutation from the property. So this is the negation of the property in the last, in the last example. So we can see, and now we want to backtrack through the abstract counter example to find an instance of an array axiom that was violated. And so we find it here. So you can see that read of A3 at one should be one. And we've written that value into B4. But when we read it in the property, um, yeah, so we've written it, that value at two, and then when we read two, we get negative one. So this should never happen because of the application axiom. So now we can say, take, this app, take the application axiom and refine the transition system such that we never see a counterexample like this again. So how are we going to do that? Like this, but this is not a very convincing instance, meaning it's not likely to generalize because we have these numeric constants. This is no good. So instead, we uh, use the symbols in the program. So I'd like to point out that this is what our tool would generate. We would never generate the numeric constants like this. This is just for you know, elucidation of the technique. But so we get something like this. And now this fits in the transition relation. So we drop the subscripts. Oh, and I should point out the subscripts just means the state variable, the state variable at this particular um, step in the abstract counter. But uh, so this fits, in the tr this fits in the transition relation. So we can add this in. And now we will now. Uh, any counterexample that the solver finds for us will have to abide by this particular array axiom. Yes.
Uh, is it so in terms of dropping the subscripts? Is it uh -huh. possible to get an expression which has uh, different subscripts, so like B3 and A4? I love this question. Um, we will see that in a second, and that's going to so yeah. Just to look forward a little bit, that's going to be the moment when we decide whether or not we can we should use prophecy or not. So you can imagine if you had I th B3 and I4, you could still instantiate I4, I4 as I next, but if you had I5. I mean, that's going to be a hint that we're going to need to know something about the future value of I5 at step three. So that'll be our clue when to prophecy, but good question. And we'll get to that in a second. But so here we are. So we've added our little refinement there, and now we've passed it back to the quantifier free invariant generator, but lo, we get another abstract counter. So now let's look at this one. And so again, we start at the negation of the property. We backtrack. We find that the application axiom actually holds. So we're, we're making refinement progress. But now we backtrack to find a violation. So now we have a violation of the preservation axiom. So you can see here that we wrote the value of A1 to be equal to one, but we, we, we failed to preserve that in this write. So we overwrote the value, and now instead of reading one at index one, we actually read negative one. So this is no good. So now we can plug in all these values into the uh, preservation axiom. But again, I claim that this is not a convincing instance. So we used uh, the symbolic variables instead. And now you can see we have I2 and X4, so we're out of step with the, ind with the indices. So this is our clue that we're going to need to know something about the value of X in the future. So it doesn't fit. We need to prophecy. And I should say that since the, since the value of the prophecy variable, variable never changes since the, or from the initial state, we can always refer to it at any, at any position in the uh, in the transition, or, or sorry, in the system. So it's going to allow us to refer to, to make a reference to this um, axiom instantiation at time two or, or whenever we happen to need it to refute any counterexample that might occur. Yep. yep. So uh, I guess what you just told me is that you can Yeah. Right. To a safety property, yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is only for safety properties, yeah. Is that clear to everyone? So now, now, we're, now we need to consider uh, how to generate the history kitchen, so how to store the value of X when we know uh, we're, we're going to need to use it. So I claim, and we'll see a little later, that we need to store the value of X when K is equal to PV1. So you can kind of convince yourself of the rationale because P we already know PV1 is the important index in the property. We know that's the property, or that's the uh, index that we're going to read the array B at. So we know we're going to need to know something about PV1. So we come up with this history condition, where HV2, so the history variable 2, gets the value of x when k is equal to PV1, else it gets its old value. So this is important because it's true at the moment we want to capture. So it's right, it's true right when k equals PV1, but it's false thereafter because since we're indexing up in the loop. This, this uh, condition will never be true again, so the value of uh, the history variable two will never be overwritten. This is important because we need to maintain the value uh, of the history variable so that our, uh, our guess of the property variable uh, will be um, accurate. Right, so our full refinement, so, the, so our full refinement that we regenerate is we have a term to prophecy X, we have an axiom instantiation, that uses the prophecy variable. So this is important to realize that this is the reason why we need to prophecy, because we needed to know something about the future value of x to, in order to use this axiom. So we've replaced um, the reference to x with the prophecy variable. And then we also have our history condition, of course. And so now we can see our fully solved array scattering example that we saw in the beginning. So we've instrumented it with the prophecy and history variables automatically. And so now we can get a proof uh, that's on quant or we can get a unquantified invariant that proves this program. But you still may be wondering about this k, equal, k is equal to PV1 and how we actually got that. So I'll just show you the symbolic, or, uh, the symbolic trace really quick. So now we can see that we, so we, we start from the negation. We find the application axiom holds. But look at this. Look at the left-hand side of the application axiom. So 
we, we, the, the application axiom holds when PV is equal to K4. So this is exactly our history condition. So this is not to you know, fully show you the technique. This is just to say that we are able to mine conditions from our backtracking search through the counterexample, just to give you a sense of how we might come up with one of those conditions. And then we're able to check that this is actually a sufficient condition in order to capture the variable we wanted to capture. But you know, that was really convenient because we had that nice proxy variable PV1 that told us exactly where we needed to read. So now we're gonna look at a more complex example. So like I said, yeah, so history condition came out of data flow. So it came out of, oh, we needed to know this about the particular index and et cetera, et cetera. So if we can't do that, we're going to need to find a history condition that uses loop invariance. So basically we're gonna need to find a point in the loop that tells us when our invariant was violated so that we can use that position in our axiom instantiation so that we can refute any other counterexample that may have that same violation. So, so now here's a little more of a complex example. So we have the same loop up here. So A0 gets zero, A1 gets one, et cetera. And then we have this accumulator J that starts at zero. And then we just add up the values of A into J. And then we want to say that J is positive, which would of course be true, just like the last one should have been true. But now we don't get to do this clever little um, logical transformation using the proxy variable because the array read doesn't affect the property syntactically. So we're going to have to figure out another way to do it. So imagine we got this trace and the application axiom holds, so we're good. And so this, so, so this might occur when we've already made a few refinements and we've gotten to this point. And then we see that, oh, the preservation axiom failed just like in the, so this is very similar to the last example where this particular axiom failed. So now, we're going to instantiate that axiom, but again, not convincing. Again, we're going to use state variables, and again, we're going to need to prophecy the value of k. We're going to need the value, so the, the value of k right here for all the old reasons. And again, we've got to store the value of k in the history variable, so our guess will be correct. But as I said. Array update does not affect the property syntactically, so we're going to have to find a way to use uh, invariance. And I claim that we use uh, implement techniques using interpolants. So if you want to get you know the full gist of how we do this, you can uh, look at the paper for more details. But basically, we can uh, mine interpolants for conditions under which to store, and then we can do that same check. We can say, does this uh, is this condition sufficient to capture the term that we want it to capture? all the way up until the property. And that's how we find conditions um, when, we, when we need to use uh, loop invariance. And so using interpolants, we find a condition like this. So we say, oh, if j is ever greater than or equal to 0, then store the value of k in the history variable 1. If not, just keep the value the same. Oh, I forgot to stop my mind. Right. So now our full refinement will be the term to prophecy k We'll have our axiom instantiation that uses the prophecy variable. And then we'll have our history condition using this, this uh, j is greater than or equal to 5 that came out, or sorry, j is greater than or equal to 0 that came out of interpolants. And so now we have our fully solved array summing example. So now you can see we've conditioned the property. And th this was true of the last example, but just to draw your attention to it, we've conditioned the property on PV1 and HV1 being equal. So this is where the history variable checks that the guess is correct. So we only consider cases in which we have correctly uh, predicted uh, the value of, or sorry, we, we've only, we're only considering uh, cases where PV1 and HV1 are equal, which means that HV1 has you know, correctly, or ha has uh, correctly checked the guess of PV1. Right, so is there any questions on this? And maybe it would be maybe it'd be helpful to ask them now instead of waiting to the end. I don't, I'm not sure, but if we're good, then we can continue. Anyone? Okay. So yeah, our implementation. Uh, so in, so this quantifier free invariant generator we use IC3IA, which is just you know a quantifier free invariant generator. And then our uh, refinement generator uh, we used, or sorry, we built this tool CONTIS, which stands for conditional history. And so this took about you know 3,000 lines of Python code, and the benchmarks and code for the tool are available on my GitHub if anyone's interested in taking a look. So, yeah. And so the evaluation. Oh, is there a question? Oh, Johnson. Uh 
Uh-huh. The, the, sorry, I, I mean, I can repeat it. Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're good. Um, the, can you go to the previous slide? Yep. I still don't quite get where does this PV1 comes from mm -hmm. because it's not nowhere that shows up in the code. Right. So the PV1, so PV1 and HV1 are, are generated by us. That we are instrumenting the program with these extra variables. So we're actually adding save variables into the transition system. So um, how is these variables generated? So they're generated through this, uh, so, so, so for all, for, from this whole refinement process. Right. So you can, so if you remember that, oh Lord, this is going to take forever. But, um, or for, sorry, if I go back, it's going to take a while. But if you remember that when we found the axiom instantiation, we need, so we, we saw that that particular term was out of step with the other terms. So that X5 wouldn't have fit in the transition system. So that was our clue that we're going to need to know something about this term in the future. Right? Because in order to reference it at, at time two, we're going to need, you know, future knowledge of what the value of X will be at time five. Okay, so, so like we this are key, so just like let's say like this P V one is basically the value at X five? Yes. Okay. But 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 it, it's going to change because because we're capturing it under this condition, it's gonna change depending on what we need it to be. Yeah, that makes right. sense. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. But yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, so this was, yeah, sorry, I, sh I should have mentioned this, that this is not really meant to be read as, like, runnable code. I was just trying to figure out a way, because I didn't want to, you know, put all the axiom in I, I, I just didn't know what would be, you know, easier to, for people to read. But, yeah, no, I, I, I take your point. Right, right, exactly. So, yeah, th th there would be formulas w w where, where we'd be referencing PV1 and saying, uh, we, we'd be... Um, we would have this exact, you know, formula in that transition system that would be able to be used in, a, in whatever proof we would need or whatever. Cool. Cool. Hey, Bill. Right. Okay. So the evaluation. Um, right. So there was a similar counterexample guided abstraction refinement approach taken by Man et al. in Takis 2021, and they also uh, introduced these history and prophecy variables automatically. But there's so their approach differs. Um, quite a bit from ours in two exceptional ways. So one, they unconditionally stored history variables. So they just delayed the amount of time that you would need to store the term. So you might store the value of X5 for, you know, three or four steps. But this is not going to give you a lot of um, power in generating a proof because the solver will always be able to generate a counterexample where you needed to have delayed by N plus one, whatever your previous N was. And so, and then their search for axiom violations was not property directed. So they used this um, technique where they took the unsat core and then looked for all the axiom violations inside the unsat core in, in, in some way. But again, we argue that this is not going to be the best um, technique, and we'll see why that, is, or we'll, we'll see how the, this particular um, choice affected the results. And so we we implemented um, this as uncontest one. So in, inside of our own tool, we we just made a branch that implemented this technique. And then we implemented uh, in another branch, uncontest two, which uses our axiom instantiation, our property directed axiom instantiation technique and their um, unconditional history variables, just so we could do sort of an ablation on what actually matters uh, for the benchmarks. And so the results though, we use the Freckhorn benchmarks. And so these are uh, single loop benchmarks and multi-loop benchmarks. So we can see that uh, contest and uncontest two uh, we're both able to solve the same amount of benchmarks with using no auxiliary variables, so no history and prophecy variables. So what this should tell you is that it really matters how you instantiate your axioms. Because on contest one is only able to solve, you know, about 60% of the um, number that contest and uncontest two were able to solve. And of that 60%, you know, maybe 30% needed to use these auxiliary variables. So we can see that it really matters how you choose to instantiate your axioms. And again, uh, for the multiple loop benchmarks, which is like the ones that we saw in the examples, oh, sorry, we can see that. Uh, so now contest is, is actually being forced to use auxiliary variables because you know they're getting the, the benchmarks are getting more complex. But again, we solve um, a lot more of the benchmarks than either on contest one or on contest two. And so then you can see in on contest two, 
it never works to use this unconditional history technique, but in, with uncontested one, it does. And so um, maybe one reason for this is that this sort of shotgun uh, axiom violation or axiom instantiation technique is just sort of allowing them to get a little more expressive power using the auxiliary variables. So I'm not sure exactly why that is. And then now, so for the results, so now we, we sort of compare, so we compared against those techniques which generate uh, unquantified invariants. And now we also compare against three quantified invariant generators, so Freckhorn, Quick3, and GSpacer. And so we can see that Contest outperforms um, all of those other tools on this particular set of benchmarks that we ran on. Yeah, so what we learned, so we learned that unquantified invariants are possible through auxiliary variables. We learned how to generate relevant refinements as our refinement generator would. And then we learned that Contest outperforms on this particular set of benchmarks. So for future work, we'd love to generalize beyond the theory of arrays. So what this would mean is we're handling quantifiers in the transition relations. So currently, it's useful to use the theory of arrays because we can just sort of, so the abstraction technique is just anytime you see a read or a write, make an uninterpreted function. And so now we have successfully abstracted. But in order to handle this, we're going to have to have, you know, more nuanced ways of like searching for axiom violations and using axioms that are embedded inside the transition relation in order to find violations. And then we'd also like to eliminate quantifier alternations. And to do this with our technique, we'd have to um, store not only integers in the history variables, but actually store arrays and maps. So that has all of its own problems. And then we'd also like to introduce invariant strengthening using maybe something like invisible invariants, because for a lot of the uh, benchmarks we were unable to solve, it was just, you know, you need to know just some sort of interesting invariant about a loop that we were not able to find using an interpolation the way we were using. So yeah, thanks. And yeah, any questions before? Uh, yeah, I'm not totally familiar with that, but I think the term prophecy variable was also used by people who made um, Rust, Horn Rust or something like this. Rust Horn that used uh, the introduction of prophecy variables to anticipate on the future values of references or something like this. Do you know if there are some uh, relations? No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. So it, you said for Rust. Programs? Yeah, it's for Rust programs. Oh, no. to handle, uh, I'm not. That, uh, I'm not that smart. I can't program. Of, uh, <laughs> no, to, it's, it's, they use it to uh, to deal with ownership and all good uh, what you can uh, expect from uh, uh, mutation. Right. No. Yeah, I, I haven't looked at that at all. Ma mainly, like sort of the the terminology proxy and history variable, I think comes from Lamport in this and his in the sort of by hand proofs of distributed protocols. But yeah, it would be interesting to look at that sort of more PL version of it. Be cool. So once you find the, um, the invariant, the unquanti uh, without quantifiers, yeah. um, uh, do they, is, it, is there a clear translation <clears throat> sorry, from them to the quantified invariants of the original program? I mean, I understand the axioms. Yeah, you can take just the axioms. Right. I'm talking about the part that is somehow specific to the, uh, to the program. Right. I haven't tried that at all, and we didn't implement that, but I, I don't know if that would... So I'm actually not asking about an implementation, right. just like a theoretical uh, translation. So you have, now you, you, you verified your program, mm -hmm. your program by, you did some transformation of the program right. to one that has uh, an invariant without quantifiers, and you found this invariant. I'm just asking whether you can uh, show that uh, by some translation of this invariant, you can uh, come up with a quantified invariant for the original program. Basically, just giving... Um, the, the quantified environment for the original program instead right. of... I imagine you may be able to universally quantify over the prophecy variables because, but, no, I'm, I'm not, I mean, off the top of my head, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. And I, and I don't know of any work that does that. But yeah, I'm not sure. It's an interesting question, yeah, for sure. So for a given program and property, uh, 
you could need multiple prophecy variables and multiple history. Do you have do you, do you know uh, how many you will need? You mean like ahead of time? Yeah. I don't think there would be like a convenient way of knowing. Or that there'll be some bound on the number that you need? No, because so like how the tool diverges on these examples is that it starts adding refinements that are not helpful. So like what happens is, you know, basically you start finding abstract counter examples that you can't refute using this technique. So like, like I said, like you, you would need an invariant strengthening that would come out, you know, maybe invisible invariance or whatever, but it's not clear just from looking at the problem that this will be one where, you know, you're going to need X number of prophecy variables. It's just like, at least, at least the way we've done it, it's like, just run the tool and see if we're able to capture it this way. And if not, we can sort of by hand analyze and say, oh, this is the reason why we're diverging. Like we needed to know that the val this particular read of the array needed, to, like we needed to know that that was greater than three for some reason because of the property, you know? Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And uh, I was earlier asking about uh, liveness properties. Do mm -hmm. you think this could be extended to support liveness? I don't know. I don't know in general how well uh, Seagar techniques work on liveness properties. I'm not sure if you know off the top of your head. But, but I mean, because to find the counterexample, you know, the liveness property would need an infinite counterexample. So I'm not sure how relevant Seagar techniques would be. But well, again, for, I don't for know. Proving, I don't... For proving termination, for example, oh, right. tries to find uh, rank functions, uh, for example. Oh, so right. I wondered if there was some, um, something there about that the rank function is like expressed over history of life. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. It sounds, I mean, that, that would be really interesting, though. That's cool. Yeah. Other questions? In there? Okay, I guess let's thank uh, Cole one more time.